Welcome to the Startup Grind. Hey, welcome to the Google for Entrepreneurs Startup Grind. Uh, it's the first event for the Jackson Hole chapter, so it's very exciting. Thank you so much for joining us. Our first uh, guest is Dan Friedenberg from Google X, and you guys have all already spy online, I'm sure, so you're here because he's incredibly fascinating. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would like to thank our initial sponsors, uh, specifically the Amangani, who's given us this facility and who's also hosting our guests, uh, which is very nice of them. Uh, uh, Navi, which is my company, we're, we're kind of facilitating this uh, event series. And T uh, TGR, Teton Gravity Research, who is filming the event. Uh, round of applause for them. <laughs> and then Steo, who is based out of Jackson Hole, uh, great clothing, outdoors company. I'm modeling some of it again at the moment. So, <laughs> well um, so we're going to, this just to kind of contextualize the format, we're going to do a 45 minute uh, loose interview and really kind of explore Dan's. Uh, biggest successes and also potential weaknesses or learning curves. Some people say failures. I don't believe in that word, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk about all of that. And then we'll also get into an audience Q and A for 15 minutes after the 45 minute session. So if you guys do have questions, just kind of hold tight and wait for the audience Q and A. And we'd love to have you join at that point in time. A lot of smart people in the room I recognize. Also, people from the tram line today, so thanks for joining us. <laughs> okay, so to start out, um, what I'd like Dan to do is kind of bring bring us through his background in terms of how he ended up as an intrapreneur, as we say, at Google X. So Dan, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, as a little bit of background, I uh, started my career working in the defense industry. Uh, working on a future combat systems program it was really about military modernization, and my my job there was to protect military secrets, keep uh, uh, other nation states from actually getting a hold of that information. So we built a lot of security systems, uh, network intrusion uh, detection systems, and things like that. Uh, and about seven and a half years ago, I found myself um, going to Google, where I realized there was a lot of really valuable information there. Uh, not military secrets per se, but uh, user data or your data. And I, what I realized was there was a big opportunity for, uh, for, for anyone really, but for myself as well, to get involved and actually build different products or solutions in order to protect that data. So building encryption technologies, authorization systems, auditing systems so you could do forensics if you found someone access some sort of information. Uh, and from an entrepreneurial point of view, what I realized is there is there's a huge opportunity and um, the way that I, the way that I really got involved was kind of wondering about my own data and wondering who could have access to this. And could someone see that data? And if so, like, what what uh, recourse did I have if they did something with that data? And so, by by kind of using myself as an example, I was able to actually come up with different products and different solutions that I thought might actually solve my own problem for myself. But in doing so, would also solve the problem for a lot of other people as well. Uh, and so, so really, like, my the route to becoming an entrepreneur, it's similar to being an entrepreneur, it's really looking at a particular market or industry, looking at a problem that may be out there, a problem to be solved, uh, ideally identifying one that you can you can uh, empathize with or that resonates with you, so finding a problem that you or someone really close to you has as well, and then applying and coming up with solutions to that. Um, I mean, one of the biggest things about picking a problem that you yourself have or someone close to you is that you come up with solutions that are practical or, or actually uh, solve the real problems instead of coming up with a solution first is a great idea and saying we should build a company around it or encourage a company to build this. Uh, the key thing there is being able to test and know as yourself as one of the users of it that that is actually going to be a solution that gets us somewhere. Awesome. And talk to us if you can a little bit about how you ended up at Boeing and how you kind of. Yeah, so I, uh, when I worked in the defense industry, I worked for Boeing, uh, which is a defense contractor. Uh, and makes airplanes, as we all know, I was based in Seattle, but I was working in Southern California, uh, in Huntington Beach, which is the defense headquarters, uh, or was at the time. Uh, and, and, and in all honesty, I found myself there through um, um, 
the same approach that I think most people probably take when looking for a job out of college, which is, will anyone hire me? Anyone at all? <laughs> and the difference was with this particular job is when I was actually interviewing for the job, I was inside of a Boeing building talking to uh, my future hiring manager, and I saw a binder uh, on the table, it wasn't very uh, carefully hidden, uh, that said future combat systems. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> and he told me, he's like, oh, well, you know, and he basically described, he's like, kind of like Star Wars, Star Trek, the future, you know, building Terminators and systems like Skynet and machines possibly take over the world, and if so, we want to be in charge of that. I was, like, I was like, I want to do that. Is that a job I can have? Uh, and as it turned out, it was. And so that was actually, just by expressing my own interest and saying, like, that's the kind of stuff that I, those were things that I was excited about as a kid, still a kid, and want to do. So um, by expressing that interest and that enthusiasm for something, I think, is what really translated into um, the job opportunity in the first place. And what would you say, so just to be clear, and most of you probably know this, but when we're talking about entrepreneurship, we're talking about living within a large corporate structure, an entity that has you know, very clear uh, goals and bureaucratic, bureaucratic ladders. And being an entrepreneur within that is actually really hard, right? Because you have to blow through all of those uh, barriers and actually create projects uh, within within that company that's different than what currently exists. So yes, it's easier because you're on salary and you've got this nice pad and you know you're not eating Cheerios every day. But <laughs> it's also very difficult because of the types of uh, again the bureaucratic ladder they have to go through. So uh, maybe you could take us from that to your experience at Google. Yeah, um, you know all the companies have some things. That Common, which is that ultimately there are people that have been there for a long time and create rules and uh, processes in order to streamline uh, workflows and in order to um, ensure that things are done effectively or efficiently. Like this is just this is part of building a sustainable business and making it scale. Um, and I think that um, in going to Google, one of the things that's really special about the company and is special today is that there are a lot of people constantly changing a lot of those rules and changing a lot of those processes and norms. And um, being an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, um, you need to often kind of challenge those norms that are out there and um, and not really be afraid to come up with different solutions. And uh, Google's an environment that's really been open to that. And um, Google X in particular is the innovation lab Innovation is really rampant across the entire company and it should be everywhere, but Google X itself has is, is become very well known for its moonshots, which are just activities that aren't necessarily directly in line with the, the, um, with the business model in place, like advertisements or the internet or anything like that. It's really about big projects that could be lucrative in the future, but are really are just good to do, good for, good for humankind. Uh, and so what I, I found myself drawn gravitating towards that group as a group that needed a lot of um, by pushing the limits, this group is you know, looking at uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and looking at wearable technology and things like this. And that there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of room in a very innovative space for things to go wrong. And so there was room for me to go in and say, okay, let's come up with all the things that go wrong. And let's come up with solutions for those things in advance so we can head them off the pass and actually not let them go wrong in the first place. And so it became a really great environment um, to cast aside existing processes and actually come up with innovative new ideas and, and pitch them to the teams there. And within that, let's talk about your specific role in privacy and security and how that kind of overlaps with the different projects for Google X. Yeah, so the, the way that the organization works is um, Google has a number of these different product areas. The, there are areas like advertisements or the, the browser or Android mobile phone search, these things that Google's really well known for. Uh, but then there's lots of groups that generally that support all of those groups. And, and privacy and security is one of those things that remains consistent across all of them. And so it's it's a space that you, know, you need to build infrastructure to allow all these other teams to sit upon so that they don't actually have to come up with creative new ways to blur faces or new ways to encrypt and secure information. Instead, you can come up with infrastructure that all those other groups can rely on and, and use. Do you have a particular project that you found that to be incredibly difficult within, or what would you say are the hardest parts as an entrepreneur in that space? Yeah, absolutely. I think that you know one of the biggest challenges in the space of security privacy is, is staying staying on top of the field. 
Um, you know, there are there are bad actors that are out there, and you want to protect the people whose information you hold from those bad actors. And like I said, you know, Google has a lot of this user data. The user data in the past was some it was more um, user generated content. So you upload a YouTube video, or you write an email, or you create a website. Like these are things that you're explicitly saying that you want to put out into the world. But you know, times are changing quickly, and there are devices that. Um, know your location in order to make services better for you. There are uh, sensors that are built into all kinds of um, beacons and drones and uh, unmanned vehicles that um, can collect vibrational information and other uh, and temperature and barometric pressure and, and a lot of other types of information. And this information about you isn't something you're explicitly putting out there. This is information that's passively being collected about you. And so you don't necessarily, as a user, always have a clear understanding of what it is that's being collected and, and have control over uh, how it looks before it's out there. And so you know, in the space of sensors, I think that this is a space where, as someone who wants to protect someone's information, you need to understand the sensors. You also need to understand that sensors, say the accelerometer, which is used as a gyroscope, for example, uh, in order to understand the tilt of your phone or your tablet, so you, when you rotate it, they can rotate the screen for you. It's a very simple sensor that can, t can tell you very um, innocuous information, the, the orientation of your device. Um, and as a result, in general, in the field, it's not a very protected piece of protected sensor. It's not one that uh, you have to request a lot of permissions in order to get access to that information. But uh, recently, Stanford's uh, Security Research Center just found that using this accelerometer, you can actually, uh, in the Coriolis effect, you can actually tell from the vibrations of a person's voice around them the high degree of probability of what gender they are. Mm -hmm. And so even though you may not have access to the person's personal information from the device that's telling you the orientation of the, uh, their phone, you can actually also tell this of their gender. Um, and like a 58% uh, degree of uh, confidence, you can actually tell with that and the user agent, you can actually tell uniquely identify people. And so more and more as we find the research centers learning things about from these sensors, we're finding that you know, we also need to be uh, kind of an arms race with bad guys in order to understand what can be learned from those sensors so that you can adjust it. For the accelerometer in particular, uh, you can do a low pass filtering system where you block the zero to 20 hertz on it and then this ability to uniquely identify people goes away. And so as build a device, you want to make sure that when someone asks for accelerometer information, you can actually <coughs> block that particular piece of information, but still give them the ability to understand the device orientation. So that's just kind of an example of where you know, there's challenges in staying ahead of, of the learning curve on what everyone else is learning from devices that are out there today. Uh, kind of a, a more um, out there example is uh, uh, MIT researchers have, uh, if you've seen the movie Jurassic Park, when the dinosaur walks, you see the vibrations in the water. Uh, if you've ever heard loud music or heard the bass, you can feel the bass kind of within your body. Um, what researchers found is that by removing sound from an experiment, uh, this is at MIT, they, they, sh they created a room with a soundproof window. And they pointed a high-speed camera through the window, and they played sound from a phone within that room. What they found is that looking at vibrations, in particular, they looked at vibrations on a bag of potato chips sitting next to the phone, they could actually see the potato chip bag vibrating to the music. And using a high-speed camera, they could reconstruct the sound waves from a distance in order to determine what was being played there. And so and this is a case where you don't even have to have a sensor that's already there. Everything is a sensor. And you can see in the future there may be a place where you're going up the ski lift having a private conversation. Someone with a high-speed camera can see the faint fluctuations in your in your ski goggles and actually read and determine what is actually being said. Uh, now that's not been proven yet, but on a smaller scale, <laughs> on a smaller scale, at least on a bag of potato chips, they have found that you know the, the, the a bag of potato chips can fluctuate by one pixel of the camera, and that's enough to really rebuild the, the signal. And so, you know, this is just an a, example of a place where it's like, okay, what's the biggest problem we have? Well. Turns out information is everywhere. It's really easy to get that information, and everything is recording everything. Uh, that you know, windows and buildings and things like this are vibrating. The smallest amount of energy being output, and, and as uh, recording devices like cameras get more and more um, precise, then they can actually learn a lot of things from them. So that's a space that keeps me awake at night.
where I'm like, okay, what what do we have to worry about now, and how can we build things in order to secure that, and how can we you know, how can we put out uh, fake information that scrambles it all, so that everything's vibrating with all kinds of noise, and it's just chaos, and then you're like, well, I don't actually know what they said because they they had a scrambler or something that was actually emitting fake noise as well. So that's my problem. <laughs> Within that, do you, so that's kind of at that 30,000 foot corporate level, the things that you guys are trying to solve. Um, what about individually? What would you say as someone who's out there trying to get Google to cover you know, Everest expeditions and really pushing the boundary as to what's possible in a corporate setting and what's beneficial to that corporation as an entrepreneur? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah. So uh, what now is referencing as well is I, I, uh, in my spare time at Google, I created the Adventure Team. And the Adventure Team is uh, we've taken uh, different like, street view camera equipment around in order to go up mountains and through jungles in order to kind of add street view imagery to locations that our cars can't get to, uh, that are difficult to get to, uh, which is a really fun project. Uh, they don't pay me for that. Um, I wish they did, but uh, they, they will find uh, that there's a lot of people that want to go uh, to exotic places and climb mountains. Um, and, you know, but getting some, getting the company to actually agree to it and provide resources and support this kind of thing is um, very much an entrepreneurial activity as well. And to do it, the hardest part I'm finding is as the company gets larger, there's more people to convince. And there are more people with conflicting goals and conflicting, um, and, and just, uh, conflicts in general, uh, but conflicting ideas of where resources should be spent. And, you know, that, that requires being more charismatic, it requires scaling and finding other people that can represent you and go and speak on your behalf. Uh, it requires finding executive champions high up in the organization who can uh, vouch for what you're doing and speak for it. Uh, and Google's very much a bottoms up organization as well, where you know, the leadership doesn't arbitrarily or you know, strategically necessarily select what direction the company should go. It sources the ideas from the ground up. And in doing so, um, if you have an idea and you're on the ground, you need to make sure that you aren't just going to the executive to convince the executive to tell everyone what to do. You need to actually go across through all the ground level and convince all the tech leads, all the product managers, all the decision makers uh, that what you're doing is a good idea as well. Uh, and that it's you know, good for corporate reasons and good for the, you know, uh, there may be a financial incentive or it's good for users at large or it's just good for the world and it's inspiring in some fashion. Like, there's different ways to convince each of these people and as there becomes more of them, you realize there's more and more uh, time required in order to actually convince them. Yeah. Nice. And within that, what, what would you say, both I think at Google and you know, knowing your uh, history personally, what would you say are your biggest take homes in terms of I championed this, I dialed it, this is how I did it, and it's a notch on my belt? Um, so some of the, the biggest accomplishments is I, I'm, o I'm very often drawn towards the ones that I'm working on now, right? And a lot of those ones aren't done yet, so I can't talk about those. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope to soon because those are really exciting things. And I, um, but, you know, the in terms of projects, you know, I talked about a lot of the data and how and, and sensors and how sensors are everywhere and, and they can be kind of scary. Um, at the same time, these sensors are enabling us to do a lot of really fascinating things in the world. Uh, and so not necessarily my projects, but projects that I see happening. Uh, you know, people are worried about drones surveilling them, but drones are also being used now to, in uh, EC mode, a group in the Himalayas is using those to surveil glaciers and show glacier retreat over time in order to understand it. Uh, they're using the same technology in order to look at deforestation, to map sex trafficking, uh, to look at all of these problems that are happening across the world in order to use that data in order to understand the problems so that they can actually come up with solutions for them. And those are the things that really inspire me and excite me. Um, now projects that I've, I've worked on um, in Google X, there's been, Google Access has a lot of different projects. There's like drone delivery systems and there's, there's uh, Project Loon, which is about providing high altitude balloons that provides internet access to the rest of the world that doesn't have it today at a cheap cost uh, or at no cost if in an ideal situation. And these projects are using the same sensors and technologies, these, these innovative things that can be dangerous are pushing the edge in order to make the world a better place. And um, 
those, getting involved with those in order to lock, to dial in the security or dial in the privacy sides of that is, is really kind of the part that excites me. Uh, more recently, uh, Google announced the, um, in, in the life sciences space, a nanotechnology that's essentially, the, the way that, that nanotechnology works in the life sciences space is that you might have little nanoparticles that can go, go in your bloodstream. Each one of these particles is essentially a, a bit or a switch. It says one or zero. And it's a, it can test for things like abnormal cell growth. And so Google has been experimenting with a pill that you can take regularly to put these nanoparticles into your bloodstream. And if they detect, uh, if they detect abnormal cell growth, then it, via a sensor, since these little particles are magnetic, you can have a, a device kind of like, um, like a glucose reader or something that a um, the diabetic patient might have or a bracelet or something. They can actually read these particles and actually tell that you might have abnormal cell growth. And you know, that's, you know, early detection is, of course, one of the best ways to prevent things like this. And so being able to really explore, these are sensors that are reading things all over. Uh, and so there's really great opportunities to use these sensors to collect information early in order to take quicker action in order to save people's lives or to make their lives better. And so those are the things that, um, you know, you don't want other people to be able to read that information. You want it to have it for yourself and for your, your medical professional. But at the same time, like, you want to be able to have that information. And so those are the kinds of things that uh, I've been really excited about. And as someone, so just to kind of paint this picture, it's, you know, similar to maybe an architect that's designing a number of different houses, but, you know, Dan's role uh, in privacy and security is cross-hatching all of these different projects. So from kind of that systems architecture point of view, it's, it's interesting to think about, okay, well, here's something that's going through a bloodstream versus, you know, a Google Loon balloon, right? I mean, those are very different things, but they all have this common denominator of privacy and security. So that's kind of, you know, the, the stitching that, that brings it all together there um, yeah, for him. I mean, I, I was, I was and am very ADHD. Uh, as a child, it was very difficult to focus on anything. Today that pays off because I get to work on so many different things. <laughs> and, um, you know, seeing all these different projects, whether it's uh, autonomous vehicles or wearables or like in the, in the smart home space, like Nest and, and other like thermostat, smart thermostats are enabling people to lower their, uh, their bills by uh, cooling and heating bills by 20%. But on a grander scale, they're reducing the energy demand that entire cities have, which helps us not burn natural resources and like just my HD has been um, cured by giving it a series of problems to uh, apply my attention to I guess so yeah and within that let's let's kind of turn from the exclusive professional sense and say uh, this is now about event adventure mm -hmm. um, what would you say in the last five or six years what are the key projects that you've been working on that have adventure as their common denominator Mm -hmm. I would I would say um, you know I've I've been an adventure my whole life um, and adventure to me is really just kind of going into unknown spaces. Um, well, one project that I, I, I mentioned to you recently, like the tram today, uh, the, 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 the going on the tram was an adventure today. Um, yeah, I, I, I mentioned uh, to Natalie uh, one of my favorite adventures I've been on was uh, climbing Carson's Pyramid, which is in Oceania, seventh continental landmass. Uh, we teach people, at least in the U.S., that Australia is a continent, uh, but in that part of the world, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea and these other countries don't call it Australia. They call it Australasia or Oceania. Uh, and so c climbing the tallest mountain in Oceania um, required going through an Indonesian jungle for six days and then uh, climbing a fairly straightforward volcanic rock. Uh, but uh, one of the members of our group was injured uh, along the way and she didn't really have, she lost a bit of blood, she was suffering from hyperthermia, there was no medical rescue helicopters that would come to us. And so um, we had seen on top of the mountain that you know, going back to the jungle six days, and we're like, she's probably not gonna make it. Uh, and so we had seen from the top of the mountain that there was also uh, Grassberg Mine, which is the world's largest gold mine. It's actually on the side of the mountain. Uh, and we, I personally had been giving it a lot of thought about like, how do I get in there? That, <laughs> that looks exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and this actually gave uh, us an unfortunate yet necessary opportunity to uh, attempt to go through that mine uh, and basically sneak her through the mine in order to get her to safety. Um, during that period of time, um, uh, we made it most of the way through the mine until we got caught, uh, and uh, she was 
sent to the hospital, so things were all good on that front. Uh, but I spent some time in, in a jail inside of a gold mine in Indonesia, uh, which wa sounds worse than it is. It actually was quite pleasant because uh, <laughs> they have really nice amenities inside of a gold mine, and um, it was a really great learning experience for me. Um, it also, which part of that I left out was, it turned out to be an experience for me to learn a lot about the mining community and the mining culture and what and how Grassberg Mine operated. And uh, while there, um, I did a lot of reverse interrogation. While they're asking me questions, how did you get into the mine? Where did you come from? What are you doing here? Uh, I asked a lot of questions like, what are you doing here? <laughs> What's this mine? What's your job? How does it work? <laughs> Uh, and what I found is that they were actually planning on expanding the mine um, to a point where they actually destroyed Carson's Pyramid. And actually they were like mining it from underneath. Uh, and so um, I, in going on that particular adventure, was al I was allowed out eventually, it turned out to be okay. Uh, they had to pay a nominal fee for, um, for services rendered, it was services, it was, it was more um, an extortion fee. Uh, but on getting out, I actually had learned a lot about their expansion plans and got proof of those expansion plans and like, found that like, they were planning on destroying a, um, a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And so I was able to actually pass off a lot of this information to people that were able to act as watchdogs to prevent them from doing that. And so that kind of became, for me, it started off as climbing a mountain and it came in the end to not just climbing the mountain, but actually trying to protect that same mountain from this mining operation that was happening on the side of it. So, um, so kind of tying that back, um, that on the adventure side, on the company side, I think that those, those types of problems have the same, they, ha they have a lot in common in that um, both require you to not really be afraid of things. Like you really kind of have to charge into this unknown territory. And, and by all means, you have to respect those areas. Like as any skier or mountaineer knows, like you have to, you know, you have to respect the mountain that you're on. But at the same time, you can't be afraid of it. You have to, you know, whether that mountain is a physical mountain that you're attempting to climb or ski, or whether that's a, a mountain of data that you're trying to process or protect, or it's a, a mountain of a problem uh, like cancer or global warming or something you're trying to do your part to solve, like you, have to, you can't be afraid of it. You have, to, you have to do your part and actually go after it. So. And I'm, I'm going to be a little critical of you here in that um, knowing, knowing how you got into the adventure side and just uh, prefacing this with this, this guy has done a lot for uh, environmental awareness, um, we'll say climate change, we'll say you know, social impact, you know, anything that's in this kind of sector of being uh, for-profit do-good. Um, and I know that, you know, in, in your heart of hearts, it was always something where, uh, you know, oh, well, I'm going to go have fun and party. And then <laughs> how do I get this into the next level? And I think the beautiful thing about your story is that within this, it's, you know, there's this connectivity between what you're actually adventuring or conquering as sometimes we look at it. Uh, and, and really, you know, starting to become one with that experience and realize all the impacts and the trickle-down effect and, you know, your, your place within that and that sensitivity is huge. And I think, I mean, I have to commend you for, you know, turning all of these amazing opportunities into awareness and advocacy uh, results. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about SaveTheIce.org? Uh, I can do that. Um, <laughs> SaveTheIce.org is, as it may sound, an attempt to save ice. Um, it started with two friends and I who wanted to go on vacation. We do want to go on vacations at times and go on adventures without necessarily a cause attached to it. But we also realized that, and we've, we've come to coin this as adventure activism, that when we're going on some adventure someplace, it's still our responsibility to do our part in some way. And so um, we've had a couple of trips where we've gone on under the Save the Ice banner where we realized we didn't know, the three of us anyway, anything about climate change. We're not climate change experts. Uh, we didn't see how the effects were hitting us immediately, although I've started to see that while being up here. It's been raining this winter, by the way. It's not just snowing. Um, we didn't know a lot about it, and so we used our vacation as an opportunity to learn about it. Uh, we went to the Baltics, and while we were in Latvia and other countries, we, we actually arranged, we told people, we're part of Save the Ice, we'd like to meet with your leading climate change experts. Uh, and uh, a lot of people, especially in the climate change industry, are very open to meeting uh, people in that space. And so we actually ended up getting a lot of interviews where we re recorded interviews of 
climate change experts and have them teach us. Uh, and in doing so, we then shared that information with our friends via social media and, and other channels. We created little video clips and we're like, here, we're, we're learning about climate change. And While dressed as Vikings. While dressed as Vikings, because, because it, it, it makes off. sense because <laughs> if anyone's going to miss the ice, it's Vikings because they live on the ice. <laughs> uh, and so, and we needed costumes for our trip, and so we had Viking costumes. And um, we were moving, going from Sweden across to, and we needed a car to get from Sweden over to the Baltics, and there was a like ferry that went across, and we're like, well, it's kind of like we're Vikings coming in here, and we're like, well, we should probably have a boat. And so we, we got a 1998 Volvo and we spray painted it um, with wood paneling and then built a deck on top and a mast and some booms and a sail. And we sailed our Viking ship uh, into the Baltics. Um, the good part about being that ridiculous is that um, people, and, and we tried to raise money for a carbon war room, which is Richard Branson's carbon offsets company. Uh, the good part about uh, Doing something like this, we actually managed to draw a lot of attention, uh, and we drew the attention of, uh, of Ladis Lassus, who is actually on the board of the Carbon War Room and is one of the more powerful men in Lithuania. Uh, and when we were in his country, he made himself um, um, available to us through showing up and demanding an audience with us by saying, I've I heard there's men dressed as Vikings coming into my country <laughs> representing my company. And we're like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I got a little nervous about it, but he turned out to be very uh, positive. He's like, this is great. He's like, I can get checks from Richard Branson or other people donating to our cause, but we're, what we struggle at doing is getting the millennial generation to be involved and to care about our causes, and you're able to get their attention. So please, keep doing this. Let us know how we can support you. Um, you know, our, our trip um, it continued, and we were able to actually meet with a lot of, you know, we went to refrigerator recycling plants and water, water filtration plants, and um, we've just, and under this banner, we've ended up learning a lot about the problems in the space ourselves, but we've also tried to not take it seriously ourselves. It's a very serious problem, but we tried to actually have fun while doing it so that others can see. When you go on a vacation, similar to when people climb a mountain or go and run a marathon and they do it for a cause for leukemia or something else, when you go on vacation, you also can, you can take time and learn about some local issues, or you can be an advocate for some solutions yourself and actually try to you know, do your part to share with everyone. I think within that, you just see, and you know, knowing a lot of entrepreneurs and, you know, growing up with, with one and being one myself, it's just this, you know, the key is really saying that is a boundary and I'm going to acknowledge it. And then I'm going to do something different. You know, I'm not going to kind of let that shape my experience. And I think that's Dan, I mean, just kind of, listening to him and, and seeing how he's appreciating and approaching things both within that corporate world and, and the adventure world. I think that key, again, common denominator is saying, okay, well, that's the reality, but it doesn't have to be my reality. There could be a better reality or there could be a different reality or an innovative reality. And then having enough, you know, chicken feathers to kind of stand up and, and go ahead and do that. And I think that's, I think that's key. Uh, and just really testing. I have an idea it might be crazy or it might be something that's completely logical that just hasn't been done or could be done better, right? I mean, I think that's, I think that's brilliant. So just always kind of framing life in that context. Um, I want to talk about, I want to make sure we get on to the laundry. Uh, Dan's got a very uh, cool project in the Mission District in San Francisco uh, where all of this has kind of come to a head and that is a you know, social impact centric uh, co-work space uh, right, right in, in central San Francisco. So I'll let you take that. Yeah, so um, you know, kind of tying things together, uh, my background in understanding and analyzing sensors is that there's a lot of things that can be done with them and a lot of great things that can be done with them. Um, not just with the sensors that are collecting information, like connected devices, uh, but also the, the big data set that gets created out of that and the analysis of that data set. Uh, and so, um, in large part, two, two friends and I have started creating a co-working space where we want to actually provide an ecosystem for social entrepreneurs, people who are trying to improve the world around them, uh, to create big data startups and to create uh, connected devices startups uh, and be connected to all the same investors and advisors and partnership opportunities that tech companies get in Silicon Valley, but actually provide that for the social entrepreneurs and give them that same ecosystem so that they can really be accelerated and, and, um, and achieve their big goals. Uh, and so we've started building that. It's called The Laundry in, in part because we 
uh, purchased an old laundromat, a uh, shell of a laundromat, and, um, and the working title was the laundry, and we realized, well, it works for us. Um, and so far, it's working for us. And um, you know, our construction on it's actually going to be done in the next two months. And so we're getting to the point where we really are saying, what are the types of companies we really want to have in here? Like, who do we want to be living with and supporting and, and, and immersing, our, our, um, immersing ourselves in and so that we can uh, understand what they're going through and, and connect them to all the right resources. Uh, and so, in large part, you know, that, the inspiration for that comes from a lot of the different adventures that, that we go on, uh, which is, you know, you go around the world uh, and you, um, you know, the, the, one of the key parts of it is like, why the social impact aspect? And, you know, I grew up on a farm in Arkansas and in the farming community that I grew up in, people focus very much on your family and on your immediate community and that was really all. And I moved away at the age of 15 and, and in search of more people, more communities, and bigger ideas. And the more that I've done that throughout life, um, I've found that there, there are bigger problems that bigger communities are, are troubled with. And the more I started adventuring and spending time in developing countries and other parts of the world, the more I saw that there's problems that I could myself in the beginning not actually under, fathom or relate to, but I could begin to start to have some empathy for. And I realized that you know, around the globe that has become a global citizen that the globe itself is something that is my responsibility to do my part to help and that's um, you know that that means looking at environmental problems and looking at poverty and, and looking at uh, food and, and understanding those issues and the more that I can use my education and resources that I have the different technologies that we have in order to create drones that under that look at environmental protection and uh, creating sensors like accelerometers that tell you the orientation flip of a device but can also tell you if someone's uh, if a human which has a unique footprint is actually moving into a, a protected reserve and is fishing illegally fishing or illegally hunting um, um, endangered animals like if we can take that technology and find ways to solve the bigger global problems then we'll have a much better chance of, of keeping the globe uh, in, an, in a state that we uh, can really benefit from. And so the laundry is really about trying to attract a lot of companies that are thinking that same way, bring them together, give them the, the different backing and uh, resources we have and, and helping them achieve those goals. Yeah. Well done. Thank um, you. No, truly, I commend you for that. I think it's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I helped Dan with some plumbing at the laundry. She did. Oh, wow, uh, yeah. Before we started construction, <laughs> I'm a plumber. <laughs> we ha we had a pre-construction party, and um, we wanted people to know about the laundry, and so we established a couple of things, um, a couple of forms of marketing. One was sledgehammer marketing, uh, <laughs> which I found was if you brought VCs or tech CEOs into have dinner in a dirty warehouse, they're a little uncomfortable at first, um, but you give them a sledgehammer and you tell them they can smash out a wall. Most of these people have never swung a sledgehammer, mm -hmm. and so they remember it. They have an adrenaline. Their hands are shaking afterwards, and so I was like, you're going to remember this. Uh, that's sledgehammer marketing. It's like they're going to remember this moment, and they're going to remember where that happened. Uh, glitter marketing is <laughs> almost as effective, uh, and what we found was that glitter never goes away. If you get <laughs> glitter on your skin or your hair, it's, it's there forever. And so what we did is we created a pinata, and we filled it with glitter, <laughs> and had people over and had them beat a pinata and beating a pinata until it breaks open is very exciting it it, it it reminds you of your childhood and the best part is the photos of right when the pinata finally burst open everyone's so excited and glitters flying through the air and everyone has these huge smiles on their faces well that's what they associate that smile with the glitter when they find it two weeks later in their bed <laughs> and they're like ah there's glitter still here because it's all in my hair and and that's glitter marketing. It made them remember us. Um, the problem with glitter marketing, the downside is it's much worse than sledge. It's more destructive than sledgehammer marketing, in that the glitter actually went into all of our drainage systems and started to back it all up. So our entire laundry facility <laughs> began to flood, uh, and it did right when Natalie was visiting. And so she helped us uh, understand our plumbing system and track down exactly where the glitter blockage had happened and try to release it. So. Thank you for that. I really appreciated that. Uh, and at that point, there was, a, there was a moratorium on glitter wars, no glitter bombing, no throwing glitter on people, no more glitter. That stuff is still showing up in, like, everywhere in life, you know. Show up at work and you have glitter on your eyebrow or something, and someone's like, son, have you been at the strip club? And you're like, no, I swear, it's glitter marketing. 
<laughs> so so with it, within that space, I'd like to open it up and just keep in mind that the questions that you do have for Dan, there's a lot that you can ask about privacy and security, and there are some things that are just uh, beyond his uh, purview to answer. So some yeah. things I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, yes. Go ahead. So SpaceX, uh, wouldn't that be an attempt at the solution of having to talk to more and more people and convince more and more people? Uh, in the sense that it, it's just dedicated to startups, but it's smaller, or is that not true? Um, SpaceX itself is uh, the Elon Musk's company that does the rockets. No, no, I, I meant the Google. Oh, Google, Google X. X. Yes, right. friends with SpaceX. Yeah. Um, Google X itself is more about entertaining and then going after ideas that are going to be these moonshot concepts. And so, you know, you know, projects that are going to have not just like a 10x impact, but a 100x impact. And like you can you can understand that by saying like, what's going to affect a, mi a billion people, uh, or what's going to um, what's going to leapfrog in technology instead of looking at like iterative improvements, which are very important. Um, you know, you launch something and you build upon it and continue to improve it. But there's times where you just want to say, okay, let, how do we just break free of the, you know, the scale that we're going and just kind of like get to that whole next level. And so... The Hail Mary in football. Yeah, and a lot of those things are like, you know, self-driving vehicles, self-driving cars is one of the projects in that um, umbrella where it's just something that, you know, the project began uh, many years ago, almost five years ago, and it's, it's you know, it's not going to make money for the company so anytime question, soon. Then my yeah. question is, what, what do you do to, to get around the problem that's developing? Because you can see eventually, because of how successful Google is, mm -hmm. you know, there'll be too many people to convince. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that like any large company, the company, in order to continue to be effective, has to reevaluate its organization and its structure. Um, and uh, that's uh, definitely not something that I'm involved in at Google-wide level, but there's definitely uh, people who are evaluating, you know, what is the right, what is the right corporate structure in order to ensure that innovation is happening and to ensure that there isn't too much bureaucracy, uh, and it requires making changes. And changes are, are scary for people. It's it's one of those things where it's you're going to make a big change, and you know maybe a senior executive is no longer the the decision maker for everything. Um, that that requires potentially losing a senior decision maker who could go take uh, an offer to run some other company or do something else. And uh, and Google has been. Uh, pretty good, at least in my perspective, at, at, at shaking things up and keeping people on their toes, which is important in order to continue to be effective. Yeah. Thank you. Tatiana? Hi. Um, how did you decide to come to Jackson and talk to us about this? Um, I came to Jackson in part because Natalie and I are friends, and Natalie fixed the glitter issue at the laundry, which was very important, and that was the last time that we hung out. And um, and I was very appreciative. So when she mentioned that there was a uh, startup community and startup grind in, in Jackson, I was one excited to hear that. And two, she mentioned that there uh, there was an affiliation with Google for Entrepreneurs, which I think is an exciting program that uh, you know encourages a lot of these startup communities to really thrive. And um, and she also threw in the fact that there might be some adventure tied in with. Uh, a visit that would be kind of in line with the laundry and in line with you know using technology to make the world better, um, and and she's come through on that, which is you know I've managed on Sunday to do a little backcountry, uh, and on Monday got to go snow kiting for the first time, uh, which I highly recommend. It's very fun. And then today, uh, Jackson gave me snow, uh, and so I was able to go up uh, the tram and have a couple runs before I had to get back to work. So, yeah. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I'm so charmed by your boots. Yes. Thank you. At first, like, I thought you were going to be this, like, uber techie guy, and you're going to just have all this lofty <laughs> robotic conversation, and I was going to be lost. <laughs> and I was, like, reassured immediately by your boots, which takes me to my question. <laughs> which is, Thank you. You have on a farm in Arkansas. Yes. And so you're, obviously, you have values in connection with the land. Mm -hmm. And so here you are in this sort of vortex, in California of, you know, fast pace, idea, idea, ideas, um, s technology, sensors, all this stuff. Um, I love the idea of the laundry think tank, which sounds pretty grounding in its own way. So um, I have some concern about us all sort of losing ground, so to speak, in favor of all these techie things and um, that we're advancing ourselves and losing ourselves at the same time. 
So how do you keep that balance yourself in your own skin where you're probably uh, potentially uh, uh, in circles that can be greedy, um, money making as the goal, and here you have this passion for, let's say, re you know, uh, glaciers and deforestation and mountains being undermined and all this. So I'm just interested how you. I'm just going to repeat that question because I have a microphone on, so that the video oh. crew can hear it. I'll try to oh. do you justice. <laughs> uh, but as I understand it, you know, the question again, just repeated from the audience, is that. You know, there's all of these advances being made in technology and modernization as such. And at, at some point, there's this feeling of losing the stuff that matters. Like mm -hmm. connectivity, you go to a restaurant, two people are on a date, they're both staring at their glowing rectangle box, etc. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, how do you, as someone as successful as you are in the tech space, how do you find that balance, or where do you see that balance moving for a general whole? Yeah, it's 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 definitely something that's a difficult to, to uh, difficult balance, right? And difficult to maintain and keep track of. Um, um, you mentioned, you know, coming from a farm, and and uh, and thank you for the compliment on my boots. Uh, th these have been on five of the seven summits, and <laughs> they they they're lasting. They're, they're working very well. They're very Viking themed. Um, <laughs> You know, I grew up on a farm, and, and I, I was talking actually to Catherine Rich about this earlier. Uh, my mom um, was uh, a single mom at times and also was very influential in, in our upbringing. And one of the things that she really taught me was to generally have this disregard for rules and disregard for what people state is actually happening and to challenge those assumptions and to, to investigate yourself. And I think that when you're looking at these big problems like massive mining operations or uh, you know the, the world is ending in some aspect and a lot of people lose hope or like feel like the, the, the trend of, um, of wealth disparity or, or modernization or other things like this are too much for them to, to address that you have to realize that again it's one of those things you can have respect for that problem but you can't be afraid of it and you have to have a disregard for people saying that it's impossible and actually go after those problems and come up with something and I think that's that's kind of just being resilient in the face of, of um, daunting tasks. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I have a question about um, how you deal with governments and or if you deal Governments, mm -hmm. um, your sphere of influence is uh, global. Um, is it an environment of collaboration, or is it barriers? Uh, do you deal directly with? Um, me personally, only when I get arrested in gold mines. <laughs> um, as an organization, Google and and other groups do ha often have to engage with governments and um, and I think that the important part when dealing with any government entity or regulators or grassroots efforts or any kind of perceived opposition or someone who's not part of your organization that has ideas for how your organization should operate is that they are also made up of people, those organizations, and those people have their own goals and agendas and ideas of what's right or wrong. Uh, and similar to how like an entrepreneur must build within their own company, you often you need a you need to have a collaborative spirit and work with them to say, okay, what is it that you need? Okay, let me see if I can get that. And you have to maintain those good relationships. And that's that's can be difficult um, because there's so many people and everyone wants time to solve their problem. And so you need to make sure to give people the right amount of time and to uh, take into consideration not just what they're saying uh, because that's their political platform or their agenda. Uh, but also like what they really mean, what they really want, and try to relate to them and connect with them and say, okay, how can we make this work for everyone? And, and oftentimes, people's stances or uh, platforms even will change based on what they learn. And so a big part of it's not being closed off and, and trying to build in a vacuum and assume that, uh, that you're doing the right thing. It's, it's saying, hey, even though I don't necessarily agree with what you're saying, uh, I should do, well, like, let me hear you out and discuss with you and try to communicate. But it does take a lot of energy, so it requires um, you know, <laughs> being dedicated to what it is you're working on. That being said, you know, with the government question, as I understand your role, is you're specific to projects that are going underneath Google X, right, versus Google's policy on privacy and security with various government entities or the lack thereof. Right. Uh, they are all tied together, though, ultimately. You know, if you're building an engineering platform, 
uh, in order to provide the world a particular service, then you know the policy folks, PR folks, comms folks, they're all engaged in the same thing. They're 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 defending or validating the existence of those technologies. So there's essentially a party line in terms of different governments and what Google is willing to bend and or accommodate in privacy and security. The the complicated part about governments in general is that if you, you as an international organization, you want to respect all of the different countries' laws that you engage with, but many of these laws are often in conflict with each other. And if you do what one country says in order to stay within the law, you're actually violating a law in another country. Uh, and so it isn't something where you can just as easily say, okay, what are all the laws? We'll just draw the line there. Instead, it's like, okay, well, no matter what, there's going to be controversy. And so the uh, one of the important things is to engage with those groups, introduce them to each other, discuss, you know, why are their laws in place? What are they ultimately trying to do for the world? Because they are, in, in essence, uh, legislators are representatives of the same user base. And they're a layer of abstraction or they're, you know, but they have constituents that they're actually trying to represent. And so, um, ultimately, I think most groups are inherently good and and I'm optimistic about the fact that they all want to make the world better for their constituents and people of the world. And so uh, when engaging with those, it's important to um, have the right people go discuss with them and help them all kind of understand each other. Can you talk about the Google Loon project, the kind of problems that you've had uh, in terms of cameras and wanting to understand how the right, so project succeeds or fails. Yeah, so Project Loon itself, I mentioned briefly earlier, is uh, high altitude balloons that are attempting to provide uh, internet access to the rest of the world. And people who don't have hard, hard line infrastructure that's you know, r running cable or um, have direct satellite connections to their homes. And so by providing these fairly low cost balloons um, that canvas the world and provide at a high, you know, high altitude, they can reach a lot further. They can provide internet access to people living in rural areas and can farms in New Zealand or in, in the Arctic or anywhere else. Um, and you know, the challenges in that front are, are many. You're, if you're flying balloons around the world, you're flying these balloons in uh, inter international airspace. Uh, you fly balloons over people's countries. Uh, those countries have their own rules and regulations for what these things are. Uh, not everyone wants you flying balloons uh, over their country. Not everyone understands what they are or even what your organization may be doing. And so that requires, you know, d essentially recreating your own air traffic control system and being able to communicate with all these different groups. Um, you know, this, at the same time, you know, you have a lot of, when, when building new technology, you want to test this technology, you want to uh, understand how that technology is behaving. You know, balloons uh, pop. Uh, you want to know why a balloon pops? You need to collect information on it. The easiest way to collect information on it would be to point a camera at it and understand why it's popping. What, what is it looking like? What's, what is it doing? Uh, but you know, then you run into, uh, if you were to go down that route, you run into the issues of you know, if you have balloons with cameras on it, that starts to uh, stoke the fears of people saying, like, what are all these things flying above me with cameras on it? Uh, and so you know, the camera could be pointed upwards at the balloon, but it doesn't mean that that information couldn't be taken out of context or misused in some way. And so one of the really important parts is, uh, one of the things that we've been fortunate to be able to do is work with really great folks that are able to communicate clearly like what it is we're trying to do in advance and think of the bigger picture and think of who all the parties are that you need to notify in advance and, and try to educate them about the problem. Because ultimately, all of these countries, especially uh, ones with large rural areas, they want access for their people. They want to improve the livelihood. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they, you know, they, all they need is the invitation to, to work with you, and then they're happy to do so. Nice. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yeah? What's your uh, daily routine look like? You seem pretty productive. I'm just going to repeat that. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, daily routine. So we're just curious in terms of Google. Yeah, just like hmm. you're like a morning person. You have a certain ah. thing. Right. Um, he yodels. My, my <laughs> daily routine um, is almost the absence of a routine. I'm not really good on um, doing the same thing from day to day. Um, I prefer it if every day I'm doing something drastically different than what I was doing the previous day. That doesn't always work well for others, especially people are counting on you to deliver things consistently. <laughs> uh, and so what I personally try to do is um, mix it up a little bit, try not to plan too much, because that, that empty space of not planning kind of allows you to be creative and, uh, and be innovative. 
Um, but I, I am a bit of a morning person, also a bit of a late person. I don't sleep a whole lot. Um, um, yeah, so I think the, the, the key thing is uh, I actually don't too much in advance look at my calendar and plan it out. Uh, a lot of people that are very organized would be appalled by my lack of organization on my day-to-day -day basis, but I find that I can still be effective by kind of maintaining a queue of, of important things. I just don't plan when to do them. I just make sure that those important ones don't sit at the top of the queue for too long. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, sorry, you had shoes first? Yeah, go yes. ahead, right here. Yeah. Um, what's next with saving ice? Um, what is next with Saving Ice? Well, um, that's a good question. I, a group from Iceland has reached out to us and they would like to do a large demonstration. Of, they would like to gather a lot of people around a table made of ice in Iceland and discuss uh, the, their future uh, and what it will be like without ice as the ice at the table melts away. Uh, and so, <laughs> we, um, so we told them that sounds great. We'd love to help them. Um, but we haven't really figured out how. So my plan is this weekend to um, meet up with my friends who are also caring about saving the ice and say, what, what can we do? What's next? So um, if anyone would like to get involved, savetheice.org. It's easy to remember. And uh, we're happy to entertain thoughts of other great things to do. We can take one more question. Hi, yes. Uh, I had a question about how you deal with uh, parts of Google, let's say Google Glass. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest draw drawbacks I think that people had in the retail space was privacy, mm -hmm. people being filmed in bars. Uh, uh, did you have any role in like protecting the privacy for things like Google Glass? Yeah, well one, one thing is I guess people weren't being filmed at all times, but what, you know, and there are actually clear signals within Google Glass when it was actually in the cameras on, you can actually see a light lit into it, um, but that's not how the world perceived it, and the perception is really important. Uh, if you look at uh, mobile phones, like smartphones, or just, just mobile phones, when they first started putting uh, high resolution cameras in phones, this was something that there was actually outrage in a lot of areas where people were saying like, I don't want people with phones, I don't want people going in the, in the changing rooms and taking photos of me when I don't know. And uh, as a result, um, the early phones had an indicator light, like a red light on it, and a shutter noise like a camera that was uh, required to be put on those phones. And, and in places like Japan, it was actually made law where this needed to be done. And what was found out relatively quickly is when everyone got these devices, they became quite aware that you can't actually easily sneak photos of people or record people. It's actually not that easy to do. And their fear of people doing that to them actually diminished pretty heavily. Uh, and, and I think the same thing goes for, for Google Glass or any other technology that isn't widely adopted. If not a lot of people have it, then they don't know exactly how it works. And so there can be a lot of, there can be a lot of fear about like, how it's being misused. Uh, and I think that Glass really suffered from that and that it just became this object that, uh, that people who had never encountered it had very strong opinions about it. Uh, and had they encountered it and used it, they probably would have found that it um, wasn't quite uh, as, as scary as they thought. Uh, but that being said, that, that perception part is really important. And no matter how uh, inherently neutral technology is, um, you know, social norms and things like this have to build around it. And, th and oftentimes if technology is, uh, if you innovate too quickly, it, it can scare people. And there, there is often a time and a place to uh, ensure that there are crutches in place for societies to understand the technology, to become familiar with it, um, until they can uh, get it themselves and, and um, develop the, the proper social norms and etiquettes around it. That being said, if there's some kind of house cleaning robot or, you know, I'm there. Right. I'll, be, I'll be an early doctor Kay. right on. <laughs> Okay, I, wanted, I just wanted to take the time to thank Dan for uh, showing up yeah. and, and sharing with us for the last hour. So I wanted to just give him a round of applause. Thank you.